Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, new talk, the last one of this year from the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía here in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Ruben Fedriani from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. And he will talk about uh, lighthouse piercing through the storm clouds in massive star formation. Uh, Dr. Fedriani, I have his CV here. Ruben Fedriani graduated in mathematics at the University of Cadiz in here in Spain. And then he obtained his master in astrophysics at the University uh, Complutense de Madrid. Then he moved to Dublin to complete his PhD in star formation in the group of Professor Tom Ray. And after that, he started a postdoctoral position in the group of Professor Johansson, Joh Johansson Tan at Chalmers University in Sweden. He uh, recently secured a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship to continue working <coughs> at Chalmers uh, in massive star formation. So <clears throat> Ruben, thank you very much for being here and giving this talk, the last one of the year. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Renat. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, hopefully you can see it. I'm going to put here in the presenter. Um, I have put here the, the cursor size really large so you guys are able to, to see what I'm pointing to. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Rene and, and the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalusia for, for inviting me to give this seminar, and in particular to Myra Sorio and, and Guillem Manglada that we have been talking during this week uh, and really appreciate their, their invitation. Okay, so without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about massive star formation. So I, I like to start with this really nice image from the HST that I think that the title is just describing this image is that the lighthouse that is somewhere here in the middle that is piercing is sort of like breaking up these clouds that are forming stars. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you more about this particular uh, region that is harboring uh, young stellar objects. <clears throat> I would like also to thank uh, the Marie Curie Actions uh, that is supporting this, uh, this research uh, under the, the grant is smart. So, okay, let's take it away. So uh, the outline of the talk, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce star formation and in particular massive star formation. Uh, then uh, I'm gonna tell you about uh, the SOMA survey. Uh, that is a survey being conducted in, in Chalmers and Virginia. And I'm gonna focus on the SOMA near infrared. Is that you're gonna see a lot of this NRI that's near infrared. Um, then I'm gonna I'm gonna focus a little bit more in these near infrared jets. I'm gonna tell you why those are important uh, through the eyes of LBT. This is the Large Binocular Telescope. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you uh, some results from from integral field units. This is a, a paper that got accepted only last week, so uh, these are really fresh. Uh, Results. And um, finally, I would like to introduce a new uh, Python module that I am leading that is called the STD Creator. Okay, so um, I think it's always important to, to ask ourselves uh, why is important what we do, no? why, why is important to study star formation, but in particular, massive star formation. Um, as you know, mass stars regulate the process of star formation from very early in the stages in, in the form of jet outflows and stuff uh, until their death uh, in the form of supernova. So they are all the way uh, from, their uh, from their birth to their death regulating their surroundings. They add instabilities here in the, in the cloud that they are forming and they can trigger further star formation and definitely enrich the interstellar medium with heavy metals that are only cooked inside these massive protostars. However, they are very challenging both uh, in order to simulate, um, to make theoretical models and observational, which is my, uh, my main expertise here in, in observations. Um, in particular, these observational challenges are uh, within that they are located at great distances. So we need high angular resolution to, uh, to resolve any details. Uh, they're normally 
in high extension regions, so we, we don't see much in short wavelength, but they, and also on top of that, they live short time scale, so we have to catch them just forming. And I also like to say that um, thanks to mass stars, uh, you know, the iron in your blood, uh, the calcium in your bones and stuff, as Carl Sagan said, uh, is due to them. And one of the reasons we are here today is thanks to mass stars. Okay, so um, uh, I like also to show you the cycle. We understand the cycle of stellar birth and death. Um, and everything more or less starts with the diffuse cloud that somehow collapses. Uh, people in the group actually, uh, back in Chalmers, studied this uh, interaction of clouds cloud clouds uh, collision or interaction between them, gravitational collapse. So I'm not gonna get into that, but somehow this uh, molecular cloud collapses and it start to uh, differentiate between different cores that start to form stars in general, uh, low intermediate and massive stars. Uh, I'm gonna show you next slide a, a more detailed process of what we understand for, mass, uh, for star formation but the cycle continues to this young protostellar system where you have all these proto, uh, proto planets and stars and so on. And then you end up more or less the, uh, the, the process with a young stellar system such as our, our own solar system. But if the, so, the, the mass of the central source is greater than eight solar masses, we believe, it sort of like goes back to, to the cycle and, and supernovae occurs and they inject heavy elements on this uh, cycle and to be here uh, to be here today this cycle must have happened a few times in the surroundings of our solar system okay so focusing a little bit more in this low mass star formation uh, these different classes uh, we are here in the gravitational collapse of a molecular cloud. And if we do zoom in in one of these uh, cyan circles, that is the dense core, very early in the, in the revolution, they start to, uh, to display these bipolar jets. Um, and actually I should say before that, through the conservation of angular momentum, we have this ball of gas slightly rotating. And through the conservation of angular momentum, as I said, it collapses or flattens into an accretion disk. This is the a naive interpretation here in green, and you have the central source somewhere here. That is the class zero phase. But then you move along the, all these different classes that you have to you start to see more and more emission at different wavelengths, normally shorter because this cloud is being cleaned or dissipated. Uh, then we basically go through all these phases. Uh, exhausting the mass of the uh, disk that is accreting onto the star that are forming, by the way, the exoplanet at the same time of the star. So this is a, a paradigm that is being accepted through the last uh, few years. And finally, we have our John product paradigm system, right? Cool, this is what we do understand uh, by low mass star formation, but in the case of high mass star formation, the story is a bit different and it's a bit more complicated due to the massive center of protostar. On that, uh, on that point, um, Jonathan Tam, uh, it's leading the so-called SOMA survey, that is the SOFIA Massive Star Formation Survey. SOFIA is a flying telescope <clears throat> that is on top of a plane and can observe and can dissipate most of the atmosphere that is blocking the light of those wavelengths. The, mo the theoretical motivation for these are the different massive star forming theories that uh, are more or less uh, basically separated between two or three uh, main theories. Uh, one of them is the core accretion that, uh, you know, here you have a few reference. Um, and the one that particularly based on this core accretion, McKee and Tan back in, in the early uh, 2000s, created the turbulent core model that you have here, the, the basic uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, but basically what it does is that these stars forming cores that ferment into clumps, rather than, as I'm gonna show right now, as competitive accretion. That is a little bit more chaotic, and um, the, the masses start basically gain their masses without being bound to a particular core. So more massive protostars can, call it in a way, steal or borrow the mass from nearby sources. And one of the main 
um, prediction of this particular theory is that the most massive protostar must be at the center of the cluster because uh, from, uh, from this gathering of mass. Then uh, a little bit more maybe exotic or uh, uh, another theory here is that violent interactions or mergers. That means that when you are really in a really dense environment, this interaction or mergers may occur. So you may have like a few lower mass stars that merge in a, a higher mass star. Cool. So in particular, this uh, turbulent core model got further developed into radiative transfer model that I redirect you to go to this Zanantan series of radiative transfer model. There are a number of papers that you can, you can look at. But basically, they developed uh, ready uh, RT models, um, and in particular, a grid of a spectral energy distribution, or SED for short. Uh, uh, as I said, this is based on the turbulent core model, uh, and they make a, a number of assumptions that uh, one massive, one main massive protostar is forming in one main core. Uh, here on the right, they also um, model a number of images that you can see how with different wavelengths, the line profile changes, okay? And you see here a cut in, in, in the image that you can see how the, the, the profile of the jet changes with wavelength. So it becomes a little bit more um, symmetric with longer wavelength, right? So you have here sort of like the, um, the outflow axis here where you, you see the profile of this. And then the far, far facing jet means that it's the one that is going away from us. So a longer wavelength, it reveals uh, their emission. Um, so let me tell you a little bit, just, uh, just a minute on the summer survey, what, what, what we have so far and what we will have in a few, in a few weeks or months. Um, so far, more or less 50 massive protostar have been observed with this SOFIA. So if you have a number of in instruments, but in particular, we have used forecast, which is an imager that goes all the way from four, uh, seven microns to 40. I mean, there are different filters, so uh, you, can, you can observe a different wavelength. Then there is the SOMA one paper that presented all the overview and first results um, and the SED fitting. Um, and then I'm, I'm showing here a number of more SOMA papers that basically presented a different part of the survey, right? Um, including high luminosity sources, intermediate mass sources, you'll see now uh, how they, they, they locate in, in, in a few plots that I'm gonna show now. And now I'm leading the SOMA4, which are isolated protostar, and the idea is to get all these uh, sources and try to predict or try to find uh, correlations in, in physical parameters. Okay, um, and also there is a, this being an extension, an effort by Vigana Rosero, that uh, is extending, is observing the same sources with the VLA to, in order to extend this SED to longer wavelength. Okay, um, this is regarding SOFIA um, images and SOFIA observations, but uh, there is one missing bit, which is the near infrared component. So this hasn't been explored yet, and now this is my task within the group. Okay, so let me, uh, before going into the results, I would like to show you what we understand of why it's important to, to, to explore the near infrared regime, and in particular, the jets, the jets, this, uh, this ejection of material. And as I call this uh, slide here, the protostellar jets as a tool. Um, this, is, uh, this acronym is the high mass YSO, young star objects are deeply embedded in gas and dust because the formation that they are going under. Uh, and they do hinder direct observation of the central source normally to optical and near infrared wave. You can observe anything in the centimeter or millimeter regime, that means VLA, ATCA, and ALMA, but uh, what we actually see in the optical and near infrared is normally obscuration. But still, thankfully, the natural consequence of accretion are disks, uh, of the disk, sorry, are jet and outflow. Okay, there are different theories that uh, defend that to form an outflow, uh, you, you normally need an accretion disk. Okay, this happens in, in also in other astronomical um, objects such as AGNs and others. But uh, my, 
my field is a high mass star formation, so I, I know uh, I don't know that much about other astronomical objects. But what, what we understand in, in this uh, field uh, is this naive impression that is showing you here on the right, uh, that we have the main protostar accreting material from the accretion disk. This is being fed. But then there is a core that is kind of like giving material to the disk. And then we have a number of ejection that is, uh, we normally call it as a jet, that is, uh, is ejection of material coming directly from the star disk system. So somewhere in there, there is a, uh, some, some different theories that defend that it could be launched in different ways, but it's launched somehow. And then we've got the outflow that normally is associated with low velocity uh, material that is being dragged or a sort of material being uh, yeah, dragged with the jet. So you, you have like, like the different layers of an onion, right? Uh, what I showed you before was an artist's impression, but this is a real image. This is one of my uh, favorite image here. That is the, the famous system Herbiar object HH212 that is being imaged in the near infrared at 2.12 microns. That is a filter in molecular hydrogen. And this is a very important filter because it shows us the jet in all its glory. Okay, And the central source, as you may imagine, is in here obscure that you know, there's been several follow-ups in different wavelengths studying the central source and the disk and so on. So this is a low mass star, um, but I also have examples for high mass stars. This is a, a work by myself actually that we observed the 20 solar mass IRAS 13481. And the driving source is somewhere, it's a pixel in there. This is a, a, a really large scale, um, image and just to give you a sense the how different they are in the sense of uh, scales, this jet extends up to almost seven parsecs, whereas uh, this one from the low mass protostar extends several thousand of AU, but still there is a big difference there. And just to give you a sense what we're looking at, because there, there are different expertise here in, in the audience, if we were to locate Proxima Centauri in this diagram here, and assuming that the driving source is the sun, it would be located here. Just to give you a sense that the jet is bigger than the distance from the sun to the closest star uh, to us. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, getting more into the detail of what we see or what we expect uh, in, a, in a typical near infrared spectrum for a high mass YSO or in general for a YSO, this is what we understand, uh, more or less. This is a naive impression of it. <clears throat> we have the central protostar in here, <clears throat> and then we have the accretion disk that is differentiated in different layers and different, uh, depending on the distance and depending on the depth within the disk, you've got different tracers. Take into account that this is very close to the star. This is uh, just a few AU. And, and depending on, on what, where you're looking at, you have different tracers. So let me focus on the near infrared tracers that this is what I'm gonna talk today. Um, we've got in the, in the mid plane, more or less of, of the disk, we've got some CO band head emission. That is a warm molecular gas that is tracing the, the, the disk. And then we have also <clears throat> some very important lines in here, which is the bracket gamma. That is a hydrogen recombination line at 2.16 microns. That it, this is a little bit controversial because it could be either tracing dionized that this wing, the surface of the, of the disk, or even has been found in low mass to be tracing the magnetospheric accretion in a, in a paper by Garcia Lopez 2020. If we move a little bit farther in the direction of the jet uh, that is being ejected from this system, we have the so-called jet tracers. Uh, and one of the most important ones are molecular hydrogen, this H2, and iron forbidden two. These are shock material tracers. And also it's been seen that bracket gamma could be also be tracing this, uh, this ejection of material, very energetic. Cool, uh, this is the naive impression and this is an actual spectrum from a massive protostar. This is the W33A. Uh, normally in the near infrared, we have this say reddening or it becomes redder 
with longer wavelengths, and this is normally due to the mission of the disk, right? And, and these uh, so-called zero band heads are, are exactly what you, uh, I was showing you there. And you can make a number of models to, def uh, um, to, to retrieve informa physical information from, from that disk. But today, I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on uh, jet uh, tracers as, as the bracket gamma that uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you right now how it looks in different systems. But before that, um, let me show you also how it looks uh, an H2 jet that I showed you before in uh, HH212. Um, this is a massive protostar again here, an IDAS uh, 16122 that is most likely located here. And you, you see a number of knots and in sort of like aligned that normally uh, we associate it with uh, jet emission, right? Um, if we do place a long slit along one of these knots, such as this, we can, you know, split the light and get an spectrum for uh, for this molecular hydrogen, and we see like a plethora of lines uh, at different uh, uh, vibration levels. Thanks to that, we can make the so-called uh, uh, derivational diagrams, and we can retrieve temperature, column densities, and such. In particular, near infrared from one micron to 2.5 microns is normally traced in the warm material, which is about 2,000 Kelvin. Uh, from these uh, diagrams, we can obtain column densities, and from the images, we can get uh, areas and get the mass of, of it. So, and these are the values that are uh, given in this reference where uh, they did a survey of massive protostars, uh, a, a small sample of it. And if we have high spectral resolution, that means that we can measure accurately the kinematics, we can retrieve dynamic properties, you know, velocities, mass ejection rates, and momentum. And these are the values that are more or less in place in these uh, massive protostars. Good, uh, this is uh, the intro for the motivation of near infrared observations, but let me also give you the motivation for SOMA near infrared. That is uh, just a reminder, SOMA was this survey that is being observed in the in mid infrared wavelength, uh, all the way from Spitz to Herschel, in particular focusing in Sophia. And this is what we see in this image. So we see a blob normally if it uh, is very evident, elongated in one direction, indicating that probably there is sun ejection over there, but we don't have much of uh, um, detail in here. So that's why we decided to observe it with the HST. And this is what we see through the eyes of HST. Uh, this is the, uh, the same source, this is G35.2. Uh, it's, it's a notorious source in, in, in massive star formation. And you see that this blob here would be covering all the way the HST image. Um, okay, so uh, this is what we saw. We saw really very clear the jet emission here, and we also got some uh, spectroscopy of it. Okay, <clears throat> and this is what I'm showing you in this slide. Um, I should say though that this is an RGB image where red is item forbidden two actually 1.64, which we believe is a shocked tracer. Blue is H-band, this is 1.6 micron, that is tracing scatter light, continuum emission and such, and J is blue, or blue is J-band, at 1.1 micron, also tracing um, continuum emission. Uh, as I said, uh, we got spectroscopy that was along the main axis of the jet, and uh, we got it from all the way from J-band to, to K-band, and here in showing you the so-called uh, position velocity diagram uh, that we observe a number of item forbidden lines that we got a total velocity of around uh, 200 kilometers per second that we associated with shocks. Then we observed also the bracket gamma that was actually a surprise because it was for the first time observed to be extended more than 10,000 AU or actually almost 20,000 AU from the central source, which is uh, here, is located here as given by the VLA. Here is, I'm showing you a close up of the region with several um, different wavelengths. And this is one of the most complete view that we have of a massive uh, stuff for me region in particular, it's yet. Um, just a 
Uh, a second here to explain this figure is that uh, the background image is the pure iron emission. This is uh, iron forbidden two. Uh, the white contours are molecular hydrogen that is probably tracing these outflow cavities, uh, the outflow cavity walls. Then we have in cyan uh, uh, 80, 800 microns. This is ALMA continuum that is, uh, uh, is depicting the position of massive protostars that are forming in this uh, little filament. And I have marked here core A and core B, which are the main, um, which are the main uh, driving sources, as we believe, of the jet. But uh, actually, a recent paper that got only submitted uh, yesterday, actually, <laughs> um, uh, that there is a follow-up in ALMA that they found, we found more than 20 sources forming in here, high mass, low mass. So there is a lot of going on here. And then finally, we have the VLA in green, that is six centimeter, that shows or represent thermal emission from the jet. And one of the novelties of this study was that we saw for the first time atomic anionized emission, uh, especially coincident. That means the VLA in six centimeter and the iron emission and bracket gamma. So that, that wasn't seen before. And regarding the bracket gamma, uh, we saw like two main velocity components. So we saw one almost at more than 200 kilometers per second that we associated with chucks and one close to zero that it could be due to irradiation because remember there is a massive protostar there, most likely shooting UV photons up <clears throat> and exciting their vision. But this is something that uh, deserves further observations. Good, so coming back to the summer survey, uh, I'm gonna, uh, just a summary, I told you that there is a 40 high masses of forming regions of stars with Sophia. Uh, that 40 high masses of forming region may include more than one source. That's why I told you before, there are almost 50 sources observed. So we have 40 regions, which some of the region more than one source. From this, uh, we started a campaign with the HST and LBT with uh, that so far we have observed 18 sources. Uh, and this is an ongoing program that, um, that we are observing and gathering data uh, every semester. Um, for those who don't know what LBT is, is, is the so-called Large Binocular Telescope. Um, this is, these are twin telescopes in, in Mount Graham in Arizona that are eight meters telescopes. So you have like two eight meter telescopes shooting anywhere in the sky that you, that you like. Uh, there are a number of instruments, but in particular, I'm using Lucy, which is an imager. Uh, it does imaging along a spectroscopy. And you can, the beauty of this is that you can observe the same part of the sky with two eight meter telescopes. Um, and, but today I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna show you just the imaging part for this particular project. Um, and I also would like to share with you one of typical observing set, just to show you how efficient this telescope is, uh, because it's big and you have two, so it's, uh, you have all, all the benefits. So what we did for the imaging, it normally takes about 45 minutes, and we take all these filters. We take the broadband filter J, H, and K that are tracing continuum emission, scattered light, and such, so we can perfectly uh, describe the region. And then we got a number of uh, narrowband filters uh, that are in you know, are depicting or hopefully are depicting uh, the mission from the jet. So we have iron forbidden 2, bracket gamma, molecular hydrogen, and passion beta, which is another uh, hydrogen recombination line in the j band. So if we do detect both, we can make some, some ratios there and obtain interesting information. Just a reminder, because I know there are, there are people from different expertise field, the near infrared goes from one micron to 2.5 microns, okay? Good, so uh, some of the results that I only reduced this data last week, so it's, uh, it's on Cepheus E. This is a intermediate uh, mass uh, protostar that is very close, it's in Cepheus, that is about 700 parsecs. <clears throat> here on the left, I'm showing you uh, a, a RGB image again here uh, with these filters. In particular, uh, I would like to draw your attention that in particular, um, the the green and the blue is not really well seen because it's, it's vastly extended. So you only see like in, in, a, in a few positions here, whereas the red, which is uh, molecular hydrogen, is mostly dominating this part of the image. You see a number of bow shocks here, 
and on the main jet along here. But you, you cannot see what is the driving source. So most likely it's here in the middle, okay? But now here on the right, I'm showing you the same image, but now selecting an, a different set of filters. Now it's purely k band that is two microns, and now you see that is, is, is better described in this wavelength. And it tells you more. When we include the bracket gamma filter that is green here, these two uh, dots appears, right? Um, yeah, bracket gamma is an indicator of young stellar system activity. It could be, as I said, this, could the jet, something going on here. So um, we interpret here that maybe one of the sources is driving the main source, the main jet here, and the other may be driving this guy up here that, uh, it, it, to my knowledge, I, I didn't know before. So this may be also an indication of multiple jets going everywhere. Good. Uh, I also would like to show you the, the region of AFGL 5180. And again, this is the, my cover image that I used in my, um, in, my cover, in my cover slide. And we also observe it with LBT. Um, while you see here, that is, is very nice and is, uh, is stunning. Uh, we don't see a clear indication where the jet is. Uh, and you may imagine naively that it should be in this direction, okay? But when we observe it with LBT in the K-band that is sort of like uh, getting through the clouds, this is what we see. We see the same structure, obviously. We see the, the main clouds being reflected. But now, again, with molecular hydrogen, we see like very crazy stuff going on here. So what is going on here? So let me show you a zoom in. Initially, this region was believed to be one main protostar going in that direction. But what we may have here is a cluster region uh, because we see many molecular hydrogen jet knots going in different directions. So that is difficult explained by just one main protostar and more than one most likely is here. Um, also, we got adapted optics observations of this region uh, with a, a science verification call from Seoul. That is the, the new adapted optics in, in Lucy one. Uh, and I would like just to show you a comparison on how much detail one can gain with this uh, AEO system. I have to say that we were pretty lucky to get this uh, angular resolution scene limited of 0.8 arc seconds, but still when you compare it to uh, the angular resolution given by the AO, that is the adaptive system, is it, just, uh, it's like eight times better. Um, and it's comparable even to the H-band diffraction limited HST, which is about uh, 0.16 arc seconds. I made a GIF here just to compare, just to give like a graphic impression how it changes from one observation to the other. So you can start resolving stars that may be seen as one, maybe actually like a binary or just a visual binary, it doesn't necessarily mean to be physically like that. But when you want to make a census, that is another step that we wanna make in our study, it, it, it is much better the, the higher the angular resolution that you have. Okay. But in my opinion, <clears throat> one of the most exciting results from this LBT survey that we're performing, that by the way, I only show you like three sources because I, I wouldn't have the time to show you all of them, uh, is when you combine it with other telescopes um, and you, you start to see how, how things that you didn't see appears. So this is the region IDAS 07299. This is another massive protostar um, that is being observed up as part of the SOMA survey at different wavelengths. So I show you here now SOFIA 30, uh, 37 uh, and 7 microns. Um, this is what we have before in, in SOFIA. But when we observe it again with the near infrared, this is what we have. So we have much more detail, much more uh, structure, and so on. And if I were to place these contours on top of this image to give you a sense of uh, how it looks, this is what we were seeing in 37 microns. So we saw like a plot. And interestingly, also when we place seven microns, we start to see where the star may be. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a little bit tricky when we make these images because you have to get the right stretch in the images. So uh, in order to show everything like the cloud and also the, the the central region, I made like a cut here. And 
show with a different stretch. It's the same image, but with a different stretch, what we think may be the central star here. However, I'm showing you now only HST, H and J band, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but it seems to be a little bit obscure. It doesn't seem to be much going on here. But when we put on top K band from LBT, this is what happens. So you, you start to see lots of, you know, probably reflected light from the, the central protoster. But I tell you more. Uh, early in 2019, it got published uh, Alma, six, uh, Alma Band 6 observation from this very uh, region that when we place it, it's like matching perfectly the different pieces of, um, uh, of massive star formation. And then you see that if I zoom in more in this little dot, it's a binary system. Okay, and this, and this got published by, by our group, in back in, in 2019. So you see how all these pieces matches very nicely. Okay, so moving on, uh, this is another part of the, of the result that I would like to show you. Are the integral field units observations in protostellar jets? Uh, this is another region that was uh, was studied back in, in 2010 by Barricade in, in the infrared again. Uh, and this is what we had before. We had like two main elongations and obscuration here. It was um, saturated, so that's why it's black. Um, this is the basic information of the cloud. Is again of the cloud, sorry, of the region. Uh, it's again located pretty far. I mean, at, at least pretty far for galactic people, maybe <laughs> extra galactic people say, I wish I had the resolution. Anyway, um, it's, it's got like a high luminosity. Uh, well, and we also put here the velocity of uh, the systemic velocity of the cloud. Um, back in 20, uh, 2002, uh, Henry Boyther did a survey with uh, 12 CO, uh, 1 to 0, and this is what it looks. It looks a little bit funny. Uh, in the sense that there is no real structure there. There is an elongation in the blue, but uh, it's not super clear. Um, and what we did, actually, this is, uh, this is work being led by Ana Rita Costa um, during a summer internship that she did in, in Chalmers as a Kasum student. Uh, this paper has been accepted last week, so uh, I'm very happy for her. She, she did an enormous job. Uh, yeah, so let me let me present the, the work that we did together. So we took observations with LBT Symphony. Uh, there is the very large telescope in, in Paranal in Chile, uh, a, a very high spatial resolution. This is uh, eight by AO. Um, and also we took uh, VLT Camus uh, from the archive uh, and we joined effort with Suzanne Ramsey uh, back in ESO uh, and we combined these, uh, these images here. Right, so the first thing that we did was to resolve the obscure region. So that before we didn't know what was going here, um, and what I show you <clears throat> is the continuum subtracted molecular hydrogen. Remember that most likely this is tracing uh, shock emission. Just to give you, you know, uh, this is just a closing of this central region, a higher spectral spatial resolution, and these are the different knots that we located. Uh, right. Um, yeah, so these knots, though, that they were identified before in, in, in previous works by Barry Catan Lee, uh, and, they, uh, and they received the different numbering for the so-called MHO, the molecular hydrogen objects, but we did, ex I mean, we, we, we could take more um, precision or they are more accurate uh, measurements. Cool. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I wanted to say here that <clears throat> the the, what, uh, the yellow stars are the continuum peaks in the near infrared. So we have a number of sources here that we want to follow that up. Um, yeah. So these are the maps of continuum emission. So I should say for for those not familiar with IFE observation, this is the closest to Alma in the sense that we have a cube. We have images and a spectra for every pixel, or we have images for every wavelength. So we integrated over the continuum and we got this, uh, this K band continuum with, uh, as you see here, seven sources in uh, uh, circle here. But then we also explore <clears throat> the, the bracket gamma emission. That is, as I told you before, a uh, tracer of, of youth. And we have uh, this S, added this S8 and S9. And since for every pixel we have a spectra, this is what we did. So we, we took uh, a spectra for these uh, continuous sources and we explore the different lines 
mainly monitor hydrogen lines, bracket gamma, and the ones that it told me. So since we have a cube, we, have, we can make this integrated flux ratio between different lines. And in particular, when you make this ratio between these two molecular hydrogen, you can get a sense of the um, excitation of the H2. If those ratios are about 10, this is consistent by previous work by shock driven, or if uh, it's below three, it should be pumped by probably the, the massive products. And you see here in the, in the flux ratio that mm, all of them are above 10, eight, 10 and stuff. So these results are consistent with shocks, uh, jets. But still we made these velocity uh, maps uh, given uh, doing Doppler shift of the most, uh, the strongest line, the highest signal to noise that is 2.12. And the, what we saw, we, we got a little bit shocked because we saw everything is blue. <laughs> and so what's going on? We thought it was one, one main outflow, but then we started to gather more data. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, a contour to, to show you better the different knots. But we put the contours of SMA, the, we, jo we joined forces with Sylvia Lerini, um, and she had 12 CO with SMA. And this is what we had. So we had these blue contours overlapping very well with the molecular hydrogen, and then this red emission, right? And we saw what happens. Also, I should say, I forgot to say that these white boxes are observations that weren't carried out because this KMOS data was science verification and, and the observation weren't completed, but still we had this main outflow uh, very well observed. Okay, so we, can, we, we got our head around it and say, okay, this is our interpretation. We have two main outflows most likely and one, maybe a third outflow that we don't see much because we don't have observations. Um, <clears throat> but this is what, yeah, this is what we think. Uh, and the reason that we're not seeing the, the red shifted outflows is probably because obscuration. So the extinction is so high in, in the far facing outflow that we don't see. So that is our interpretation. However, with this SMA a longer wavelength, the light can get through and therefore being observed. Okay, so uh, let me show you all the mesh that is in this central region, in this uh, cluster region. These are uh, the symphony continuum point sources. And, and we had a look at the literature to see what was going on here. Um, we got from the Alma archive, from Sylvia Lerini also, Alma 2.7 millimeter, where the picks the, yeah, the continuum dust emission where massive, prot well, the, where protostar may be forming. Um, and a recent study by Isaac 2020, she, she actually um, explored this Alma data and, and, and observed six millimeter sources. Uh, also in that, in that paper, they, they observed with UMRT, uh, and observed two main emissions, uh, R1 and R2. And also with uh, the VLA, a six centimeter reservo and collaborators uh, got like many, many, many sources where uh, some of them are consistent with a protostar and some of them are consistent such as J with a radio knot, uh, jet. And finally also, this is a, a more recent uh, paper, I mean, a, a later paper uh, by Zapata et al. Uh, they observed in 1.3 centimeters, that is, all the mess going there. But from all this mess, I would like to draw your attention uh, to these two circles, which we believe are the two main driving sources. This has been suggested also in previous paper, this F uh, not, but we propose in, in, in our paper that A or R2 and why so all these names it, it is, the, is another driving source. And when you look at the spectra or spectrum, in the infrared, you see this rising continuum, which is consistent with a YSO. Okay, so we have this picture with two or more jets, probably driven by this, uh, these two main sources. Okay, to, to finish with this job, with this work, we made a spectral energy distribution fitting for this uh, region. Uh, we assume that the SED is dominated by one main protostar because I showed you there are many there, but probably one of them is dominating the, the SED. This may be true, this may not be true, but this is our assumption and this is how we did the, this, uh, this next part of the analysis. And we didn't have much um, 
much to do because when we observed the mid infrared images, we only saw one big blob. So we saw the Spitzer, this is the RGB uh, glimpse image, and then the Spitzer MIPS 24 microns. So we, we only saw one big thing. So we, we could not resolve different components and also the Herschel 70 microns. Okay, so this is the SCD results here, um, uh, and we fit it with the Zanantan model. This is also based on the turbo, uh, core turbulent model, as I showed you in the introduction. And these are the different results. Uh, and I'm gonna show you now how I did that, uh, that I think is gonna be interesting. Uh, and these are the results of, uh, of this um, SCD fitting. And one of the most important things is that the, ma uh, the mass of the core is about a few hundred uh, solar masses. <clears throat> and the current mass of the protostar is about four, uh, uh, four to eight which is consistent of being in the way to become a massive star because uh, the models output a mass accretion rate of about 10 to the minus four. That means that if you are creating at this stage from 10 to 20,000 years, you become a massive star. Good. Now to finish off and to wrap up, I think I'm still on time. Um, I would like to tell you <clears throat> uh, what we did in in the effort of creating these uh, SCDs, right? Um, and this is uh, the last few slides that I'm gonna present that is called the SCD creator. This is a Python module that I am leading uh, together with others that, uh, that performs uh, measuring of fluxes and SCD fitting and is heavily based in these two um, modules, uh, photo utils and astropa is just a number of convenient functions to help the life of the user. And it's based on the ideal version of uh, Zanantan 2018 that they perform a similar study. But it's a little bit, you know, ideal is not, it's not a free software and it's not that user friendly. So yeah, I, I made this uh, that you can simply do a pip install SCD creator is hosted in GitHub and PyPy, PyPy and you can simply do this, uh, this pip install and, and, and it will install of the requirements and dependencies and such. Okay, so just a uh, quick overview of the SCD creator that can be used for anybody by anybody. Uh, I have tried to make as user-friendly as possible. Uh, there are two main classes. Uh, there is the SCD fluxer and the SCD fitter. So both of them can be used together or separately. So say that you have your fluxes measured with your super technique and you want to fit the Zanantan model because you're interested in, in massive star formation. You, you can take your fluxes and fit it there. Or the other way around. So you have your, you have your model, but you don't, you don't trust the fluxes that are given, for example, in the catalogs because they are a little bit, uh, you, you have a special situation. So you can go to the fluxer, get the flux. Um, and I, I have made the effort to, <clears throat> to read the, the headers and you don't need to, to bother about anything. So you can measure fluxes in Alma data, Spitter, Herschel, uh, and Sophia, and others. So uh, the code made the transformation by its own and gives you Jansky. But if for any reason you have like a, a special header or something like that, you can get the raw flux and make the transformation by its own. It's just a way, the, the, the only thing that you need is to put the coordinates of the system and the aperture size. Then I'm gonna tell you in a second how we chose the aperture size. And then you got value, info, and plots in, in a convenient way. From the SED fitter side, obviously with the SED fit that you can select the, the extinction law, the, the, the visual extinction values and so. And then you have, again, a number of uh, convenient functions to get the model info, to plot the CD, even to create a latex table for your publication just with a line of code. But now in the next, uh, in the next slide, I would like to tell you uh, the, the, optical, uh, the get optimal aperture uh, algorithm that we have developed uh, um, in, in collaboration with Zoe Telpka, actually. She's uh, a graduate student in Virginia, uh, and she has been leading this, uh, this algorithm that uh, what it does is to scan the image and select what we believe is the, the optimal aperture. What, what, what do I mean by that? We are normally dealing, as you can see here on the left, with extended emission, 
So fluxes given by the catalogs that are normally PSF fitting of point sources are not super useful to us because we need to enclose most of the flux in order to make the CD. And this is a, um, an informative plot also that is uh, aperture versus flux. And we, we would like to, you know, to consider most of the flux. What, what does it mean? That means that our criteria is that if we increase the aperture radius by 30%, if the flux does not increase by more than 10%, we stop there. Again, there is a function in the SCD creator that does that, and you can tweak those parameters. Why is this done? Because uh, in, recent, in, in previous paper, in summer one, two, or three, we did our best to fit it, to take most of the flux kind of by eye. So it was difficult to reproduce the result. So now it's an unbiased way. So we select the input parameters and anybody can reproduce it. And this is a particular example of G35.2. And these are all plots generated with this, uh, with this code, just with a line of code. And, uh, and these are plots of the SCD with the observations yeah, ordered by the chi-square value. <clears throat> uh, and these are the normal plots that we show. We show the best five because you know, it's, it's difficult just to get just one uh, best model. And if we average this and we, we take all the values from sum of one, two, and three, we can get this very interesting plot that, that are right now made for SOMA 1, 2, and 3, but it will be populated with more sources in SOMA 4 and SOMA 5. That I'm leading SOMA 4 and Zoe is leading SOMA 5. But one first tentative result in here is that to form a start more massive than 20 solar masses, the, the best models outputs that one needs a mass surface density greater than one. Okay, this, uh, I know that we only have a few points here, but hopefully this will be strengthened with the more points that we put here. So that was a one tentative result that was presented in SOMA 3. Okay, cool, so I think I'm on time. So um, the conclusions that, uh, of this talk is that uh, the SOMA survey is giving us clues about uh, massive star formation, <clears throat> but uh, the neighboring component was, was missing and now we are being uh, completing this, uh, this effort uh, and opening new avenues in this survey. Um, as I show you, I hope I have convinced you that uh, near infrared observations are very important and reveal this uh, massive protostar either by taking, you know, joining the dots to, to find the protostar that may be missing or to uh, describe the region around it. Um, we are creating this is in the oven that should be out any anytime soon as a paper. Uh, the SSD creator provides like a toolkit to perform a convenient way aperture photometry. This is already uh, in other packages, but what it does is to give you absolute freedom to make uh, these measurements. Um, and as I said, it could be used any images. So uh, please do check it out. Um, but I guess if you have to take only one message from me is that <clears throat> in a star formation, there is a still a lot to be done. So that's good because we have we can still have a job. But uh, what it looks at least for a few sources is that it may be as a scalar version, meaning that you have a disk, bigger or smaller, a jet that is normally larger, more energetic and faster. And they may, they may proceed as a scalar version of the low mass counterparts. And before I finish, before I... I, I finished the talk. I would like to make an announcement of, uh, of the big international conference that is, uh, is organized by Jonathan Tan in Chalmers uh, that is from Stars uh, to Galaxies. Uh, is the second, this is a series of uh, conference that he's been doing um, in Florida and now in, in Chalmers. Um, it's, it's from the 20 to the 24th of June. So it's fantastic because you'll be in Chalmers in Sweden for the midsummer in the 21st, that is the never ending day. And we have a number of invited speakers here that uh, we are really pleased to say that Raihan Gensel and Andrian Gessi are coming uh, to give their talks and also public talks uh, about their uh, Nobel uh, Prize. And with this, I stop and I thank you very much for this opportunity. And I will be very happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben, <clears throat> for this very interesting talk.
Uh, yes, please, uh, the talk is open for a question now. Please uh, raise your hand for doing that. Uh, go to the reaction button there, and then I will uh, uh, leave you uh, to the question. Okay, Mayra, you're the first. Please go on. Yes, thank you, Ruben, for this nice uh, interactive talk. I had several questions I would like to ask. Some of them uh, regarding the spectral energy distributions that you have uh, made a publicity as a CD creator, but I would like to know which, is, which are the assumptions uh, regarding the opacity. Are you assuming the same opacity, those grains, for the case of low mass protostar, or are you assuming a different opacity to produce or to uh, construct the spectral, the synthetic spectral energy distribution for high mass protostars? Right. So, <clears throat> what we assume uh, are in, in detail in the. Can you hear me okay? Through the spectral synthetic spectral energy distribution for high mass protostar. <laughs> there are some <laughs> echoes and repeat. No, oh, okay. It was, uh, it was being repeated. Sorry. Um, yeah, so all the details are in the, in the Zanantam radiative transfer models. Uh, I think they, they did consider uh, opacities for uh, for these massive protons, but they did use all of them for the same. So I think they're using the KMH, I think from the 90s uh, opacities. Uh, and this is actually something that we want to explore. How does this SCD fitting changes with opacities? So this is something that I know Yijian Sang is working actively on it and now in, in the new postdoc, but I, I don't have an answer right now for you, but I hope I will have it in the next time that we meet, because I know that he's actively working on it, and we may include it in the in the new uh, in the new version. But so far, we're assuming just one for all of them, so no no much detail in that. It seems to me that the results is going to depend a lot mm -hmm. on the opacities. Uh, it would be great to constrain uh, particular course. opacities for the case of high mass uh, protostars. Mm -hmm. And the second question is: You allow me to ask you. I know you are focusing jet emissions, but I wonder if you are able to detect perhaps with high angular resolution ALMA observation or in the near infrared, mm -hmm. the disk of the targets that you are studying the jets, no? Right. I am very, um, I had a lot of interest to detect compact disks around massive star. You mentioned several targets that you mm -hmm. are following in near infrared and of course also the ALMA. I wonder if you are able to detect also the disk and the size of this disk in the case of massive project stars. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, we do. So happy, happy news for you. So we we are able to to detect that uh, that this commission, although there is this review by Mike Beltran 2016 that it says that <clears throat> we don't know if they are actual disks. We know that this emission around the star are they toroids? Are they just mass going around? I can tell you that there is a disk like emission around the protostars. I, I wouldn't put my hand on fire to say, you know, they are actual disks as we understand the low mass, but I can tell you that the follow-up of some sources in the ALMA has given us many uh, disks. In particular, the, the image that I showed for IRAS 07, that was the, the binary system made by Yi Zhang. Zhang. Uh, they detected continuing emission and also H30 alpha. Uh, which is a recombination line. And they did something very interesting that was the centroid of the, yeah, the display, displacement of the line with respect to the continuum, that is the photocenter shift. <laughs> and surprisingly, it follows perfectly uh, the disk of, uh, of massive protostars. Actually, the paper that got submitted um, yesterday or, or last week, um, they also showed on another protostar, the H30 alpha, and when you do these channel maps, you see how perfectly it goes from blue to red along what we believe is a disk. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I know the platinum structure that Beltran had reported uh, as a disk, but mm -hmm. there are solars. And I don't think 
they are really these. We are especially focused in a small compact disc around protostar, which we believe are real accretion risk. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Uh, also, it's a, follow, a follow up on that is that, in, because I didn't answer the near infrared bit, uh, I have also observed myself disc emission from in the near infrared. However, I have to warn you that we, we normally don't see directly. So we don't see a beautiful disc as we see in Nauma. We see obscuration and what we see is this reflected light as I told you. So if I, if I am the star here that is obscure, but there is a mirror that is normally the, the alpha cavity walls, the light reflects and shows emission consistent with, um, with the disc. That means um, CO in the 2.3 microns, and there is also some follow-up results using gravity, that is the interferometer in near infrared, that has observed CO very, very close to the protostar, to the massive protostar, actually closer to the continuing emission, because we measured the visibilities for, I should have prepared a slide, but I don't have it. Uh, we measured the visibility for the continuing emission, and when we measure the visibilities, this consists to being closer to the star than the continuum, which is normally associated with dust and, and stuff. So yeah, and I think now it's more exciting because they're more they're coming more results on probable disks of Hamas uh, white cells. Okay, thank you, Mayra, for the question. Thank you, Ruben, Emilio. You have a, another question? Okay, thank you very much, Ruben, for this really truly very interesting talk. Um, you know, I'm very passionate talk to all right so my question is i have a question one of them is concerning the table you have with you have uh, the 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 mass of the molecular core and also the mass of the star okay the mass of the star you consider is, is in the in the center of the molecular cloud i saw that for example you have a uh, mass for the molecular cloud of 400 and on the contrary, the mass of the uh, of the star is above four solar masses. Is that true? I think, in particular, that well, let me let me pull up my presentation. But I think the particular case that I had eight hundred, sorry, yeah, four hundred masses, solar masses. I had eight solar masses uh, consistent. So let me pull it up. <clears throat> So I guess you are referring to this last uh, line here mm. a little bit. Um, I have to say that as you can see, I think it's more evident here that the mass of the core and the mass of density are degenerated in the sense that uh, the higher the mass of density, the less mass of the core you need in order to form a massive product. So like, you know the way here you have like a really high yeah. mass of the core but a low mass surface density so it's sort of like and then you do have a higher mass uh, stellar mass current i have to say there is the current stellar mass so this is evolving all right all right okay because now according to this the star formation efficiency is very low it is indeed yes it is enough. okay. So, and this is uh, <clears throat> this being works by Jan Staff in back in 2015, 2019, and 2020 that is doing um, magneto hydrodynamic simulation of jets. Uh, mm -hmm. And you see how how the cloud is basically blown up uh, when you when you get to eight, 16, or 32 solar masses, it's, it opens a lot the jet and kind of like destroys the core, kind of. So, and can you estimate the final mass of these protostars? Yes, actually, in the, uh, there is evolutionary tracks that we follow in our models. Uh, and what we also an output that we normally don't show is uh, the current time of the star. So yeah. we have the, the massive, pro the current mass, the current time. So you can estimate yeah. how long, I mean, for and how long no. it should be accreting. And then you have the mass accretion rate. So you can make a rough estimate of the final mass of the star. However, as you know, the, the mass accretion rate is not continued, but it's episodic. So, you know, we have all this, uh, the, the, the devil is in the details, right? When you go into the details, everything uh, is messed up. <laughs> okay. And, and now the last one is a uh, concern, a collateral question. It's about the LBT. 
Mm -hmm. It was supposed that the LBT was an interferometer. No, no, no. <laughs> it is, it's that LBT is the large binocular telescope, and then we have the VLT, which is the very large telescope. I don't know, but do you are using LBT? No? I think you cut up, Emilia. I couldn't hear you. Data from LBT. Oh, sorry, because, okay, but, but you have data from LBT. I do, but it's imaging and a spectroscopy is not interferometer. All right. So because I saw that the resolution power was not very high, was uh, well, lower was, than one second or something like that, but not was so something connected to an interferometer, something no, 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 no. from an interferometer. All right. OK. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. Thank you, Emilio, indeed. Thank you, Emilio. We have another question by Guillem. Please go on. Hi, Ruben. Thank you very much for this nice talk. And I think it was very didactic, very clear to, to, to fix some ideas and, and ideas and some concepts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had a, a question related with the question of, of Emilio. I, I, I know the, the also the, the, the binocular telescope is not, is not an interferometer, but I, I, I am curious because I'm not an expert. Which is the advantage of using two telescopes, that two twin telescopes? Uh, it's just uh, uh, to have a larger area um, with the need of have a, a very large uh, mirror, or which is the, the, the advantage of, of the telescope? So uh, the clear advantage is that it's more efficient in the sense that you can do more in less time because it's like, it's literally two telescopes shooting at, at the sky at the same position. But you can say, okay, I don't spend several million dollars just for that. I think when they built the LBT, uh, the, the real beauty was to combine instruments. So you can combine multi-object uh, spectroscopy with imaging. For example, you can take an image and then you can do a spectra at the same time. So that is really good in the sense to conserve um, when you want to make, when, when it's important to make observation at the very same time. I'm using it efficiently, but I'm not exploiting it all, all the capability that the LBD has because as I said, there are many observers that may use Lucy, for example, with MOPs, with which is another uh, another instrument. So, uh, in particular, the advantage of having two telescopes that you have, you can have several instruments combined. Yeah, so it will be useful, for example, in fast evolving objects, for for yeah. example, right. and you you need simultaneously. To, to do uh, different observations. Uh, probably in a star formation, you do not need to, to be this uh, critical uh, simultaneously. Okay. And I have a couple of, of comments uh, because you, you comment that, that you put the, the, the star of Proxima Centauri uh, to illustrate that in, with one of these giant jets, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the formation of our sun could have uh, impacted the, the also the, the, the distance at the distance of Proxima Centauri. But this is not only true for. Uh, high mass jets, also in low mass stars, the stars as, with masses as low as the sun or even smaller, mm -hmm. is the fraction of the solar mass. They are, they exist, these giant uh, parsec scale uh, jets of, with several parsecs. So uh, there is a nice work on, on, on uh, Johannes Loffel, for example. Uh, he sampled in, in the mm -hmm. 19th uh, uh, several low mass star forming regions. And there are these very impressive, very narrow, extremely collimated jets that reach several parsecs. So uh, they reach probably the, the formation of our sun and the formation of Proxima Centauri. Tauri, can, it's possible that they have been contaminated uh, from the, the emission of uh, the residuals of the formation of the, the other star. So it's not Absolutely. just in, in high mass. Okay. Right. And, and, and also, I, I, I want just to commend you that you mentioned that in J, uh, 
uh, G35, you, you find several, uh, with ALMA, several low mass scores in, in mm -hmm. association with, yes, I, I don't know, you are aware of uh, work we did a couple of years ago with, with Gemma Busquet, because in, in age 80, which is uh, uh, like a prototypical uh, high mass protostar, we, we found 25 low mass uh, cores uh, right. that can be modeled as disks uh, in association with the high mass protostar, which is in the middle. So in the surrounding, ALMA was able to detect 25 low mass uh, well, companions. And were, were you able to make some estimates of mass segregation? Yes, of course. We modeled <laughs> the, the disk and then this reported in this Because in this we paper. have also tried it and we have, I mean, the paper is now being revised, I guess, but I can say that uh, uh, we have tentatively said that there is some mass segregation there. So let's see, um, yeah. Uh, that, that's good to know that there also been some other efforts. Uh, yes, I think our paper was the first report of something similar to this. Yes, it was a discovery with, with ALMA. Uh, it was a, 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 um, an additional result from the main paper, which was the imaging of the disk in this protostar. It is clearly a disk, a nice disk. Uh -huh. And with the correct size, the size that the the accretion theory says should have the true disk around uh, high mass protostars, not these very big structures that would probably are unrelated with the true disk. Is it is it the Busquet twenty twenty or three ninety? What is it? I do not remember the oh, we can, the, we can talk the year. Money. Uh, I think it's a few years ago. It's, okay, okay. We, uh, we can we can maybe exchange probably more. nineteen or so. Okay. Thank you. Guillaume. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Guillaume. Other question for uh, Ruben? Okay. Seeing none and seeing the time. We can close the talk here, please. Uh, Ruben, thank you very much again for this uh, talk. Thank you, <clears throat> and thank you all for the assistance. And uh, see you next year with the next uh, cycle of uh, talks. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Rene. Merry Christmas.